Tours. Good evening. This is Richard with Travel Tours. Welcome to the show. We'll be talking with Robert E. Wood, who is an artist and writer. We'll be talking with him shortly of what the Space Opera Society is all about. SOS is a nonprofit independent production facility that brings together writers, special effects wizards, and other creative talent from some of the most recognizable and respected science fiction franchises, including Stargate, Space 1999, Battlestar Galactica, and Star Trek. Their mission to create projects that will rejuvenate the space opera genre and deliver the best content conceivable directly to viewers. Now, some of the projects they have coming up they'd like to uh, get off the ground is uh, one is called The Rock, 60-minute drama series, Royce Banyan, Conquest of the Stars, Starlight, which is a 30-minute comedy series, and the Space Opera Society Presents anthology series. Let's go ahead and bring Robert online and start talking with him. It's a pleasure to have you. It's great to be on the show. This is a brand new organization. Can you tell us a little bit first about the organization and then your role in the organization? Sure. The Space Opera Society, SOS, is uh, basically the brainchild of Eric Bernard, who is in Montreal, Canada. Eric uh, has been somebody that I've known for, I think, about 13 years now, so quite a long time. He's in the television industry and has been for a couple of decades, if not longer. I think about 24 years he's been in the, in the TV industry in Montreal. This is a dream project of his to create original science fiction television programming, specifically outer space science fiction programming, you know, the space opera, classic kind of show like Star Trek, Space 1999, Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars, you know, those outer space shows, which no one is doing today because, you know, they tell us it's too expensive and uh, that there aren't enough viewers for it. But we all know that's not true. So we're trying to be an innovative uh, way of creating those programs directly for the fans who want to watch them. Yeah, I have a couple of different roles in SOS. One of them is that I've been working on developing some of the original series that we are wanting to create and produce uh, in conjunction with other people. I have also been working on some script writing, and I'm also working on organizing the book publishing end of the SOS business because we want to do TV tie-in novelizations for our shows. And so I have some uh, experience in uh, writing books and in publishing books and self-publishing books as well. And so I'm using some of that knowledge to, uh, to work on that department for the Space Opera Society. Now, Robert, how long has everybody been working on this project? I've known Eric for a while. I worked with him promoting Space 2099 when he was involved in that a number of years ago. Dragon right. Con. So I've known Eric for about four or five years, I guess. There's a lot of movers and shakers that are joining the Space Opera Society. So exactly. tell me a little we're, bit about we're that. Adding, yeah, we're adding new people regularly. If you watch us on the, our website, who we are, there's a page where it shows the, the photographs and the names, and you can click and read bios about the people who are involved in the Space Opera Society. And, yeah, there are, there are new people being added all the time, which is really exciting. And there's some amazing professionals from – all kinds of different sci-fi shows. So that's a really terrific team that, that Eric has built and, and put together. We've been working specifically on this for a couple of years. We've only just gone public. It was September 13th of this year that we just went public. We had a in-public personal launch at the Montreal Comic Con, as well as launching our website and our fundraising campaign. That all happened September 13th. But we've been working for about two years before that, developing projects, working specifically on a, a sequel series for Space 1999, which is one of the concepts that we would like to push forward, called Movies Off a Legacy. Years ago, Eric was working on a project called Space 2099, which was a, a revamping of the original Space 1999 series, where some of the effects would be updated and some of the little, you know, flaws that exist, you know, they happen in all shows, would be tailored out of it. So that was something that he was working on for a long time and would still, uh, he would love to still do that, and hopefully it may happen. We are in an early stage of our dealings with ITV, who own the rights for Space 1999, 
And so we're hopeful that they will uh, be very excited about the Moonbase Alpha project that we have. And perhaps, you never know, as part of that, they might be interested in Eric's Space 2099 as well. So that project, I think he's still hopeful that it will eventually happen. I believe there's some video, or it was at one time, Eric Mata just added it again. There was a, a future past enhanced. Yeah, uh, people yeah. Can go I there think, and... uh, I'm not quite sure if it's linked on our Space uh, Opera Society website or not, but it's certainly, I know it's on, I'm sure it's on YouTube. I've seen it on YouTube. But people can okay. go on there and take a look at what we're talking about. What Eric did was he, he added colorization and special effects, and it's very impressive what they did. So I'm really happy to see Eric and everybody associated with this doing so well. This is really something that is really needed for the science fiction genre. It's an amazing project. What's exciting about it too? Let me. I'll just say quickly: is that is that you know it's not just uh, you know fans, but it's really amazing top TV professionals who've been involved in a whole spectrum of different science fiction shows who are part of the the Space Opera Society team. So it's an amazing professional group. So people really should check out our website and, and see who's involved. It's inspirational. Very much so. Now, isn't there a way for professionals to send a resume in through the site? I think I saw something yes. about there. Yeah, or if you want absolutely. Other people involved, they can easily do that. Yeah, there's a page on the website where, where it's actually the same page where you see who we are, who is already involved in SOS, and there's a link there where you can click on if you think that you have uh, experience or talents or abilities or skills or anything you know that you feel that we could use. You can write to us, tell us who you are, what you can do, and ask you know if uh, there's room for that skill in the team. And that's really how a lot of these new professional people are, are actually reaching us now. They're seeing what we're doing. They're excited about what we want to do. And they're saying, hey, you know, this looks great. I'd like to be a part of it. And they're coming on board. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. I know Tammy, and I'm, I'm just going to touch on it for a second and then talk with Tammy a little bit more about this. But she reached out to Steve Neal of Steve Neal's Garage, a gentleman that's been involved in special effects since the late, 60s, early 70s. He actually did spot yes. years on the Star Trek The Motion Picture. So Steve has yes. his own YouTube channel. I want to talk to Tammy a little bit about that. So we won't Absolutely. touch on that too much. But that just shows you that the, the quality of people that are coming in that are excited about this uh, this project. So um, Now let's touch on a little bit more about your art. Robert, now you, you travel down, uh, you, you paint in Canada. I noticed a lot of scenic paintings. So do you do you go and, and paint in the mountains in Canada and then go down to Baja, California and paint there as well? Or tell me a little bit about your painting. I do, yeah. That's exactly right. I do a lot of variety. You know, some people are just like actors. Uh, painters can often get typecast into one specific theme or genre or, you know, one type of subject matter, you know. Oh, that guy paints mountains and that guy paints cowboys on horses and that guy paints flowers. And I never wanted to be typecast. So I always made it a point. My, I've been painting for 24 years. Uh, this November, 24 years, I've been doing it professionally. And I always made it a point to do something different all the time so that although I'm still painting landscapes, I'm still painting flowers, I'm still painting uh, these things that I've been doing for 24 years, but I'm always mixing it up and adding in something different. And it keeps it you know, really fresh and fun for me and hopefully fresh and fun for the people who are looking at my work, but it also keeps me able to do everything I want to do because no one has that kind of set expectation of what they're going to see from me. So that one aspect of it, I do, yes, I do a lot of Canadian landscape. That's where I live, and that's where a lot of my career is based from, is here in Alberta. But I also have a place down in the Baja, the southern Baja, California. I do a lot of Mexican scenes, I, you know, desert landscapes and ocean and little villages and all kinds of subjects like that. So, uh, yeah, as I say, I like to do a lot of variety. Now, Robert, are you a snowbird? Do you only go down to Baja during the wintertime, or how many times do you end up going down to Baja during the year? Well, at this point, we've only been getting down, on average, about once a year. And I would certainly love to you know, be there more, I'd love to be there permanently. That's the eventual goal. But at this point, it hasn't been realistic to make that happen yet. So this coming year, we're going the end of February into March uh, down to a place in Baja Sur called Todos Santos. Everyone knows where Cabo is on the southern tip of the Baja Peninsula. 
if you drive from Cabo up the Pacific coast, about 45 minutes, you get to this little town called Todos Santos, which has about 6,000 people or so, depending on how many snowbirds are there, as you say. Uh, but for a small Mexican town like that, they have about a dozen art galleries, which is phenomenal. I don't know anywhere else that has that proportion of galleries to population. Uh, they have fantastic array of beautiful little boutique hotels. They have incredible restaurants. This little little Mexican town has three great Italian restaurants, for example, just because there happen to be a certain amount of Italian expats who live there. So um, it's just a phenomenal place, and that's where we have property, and uh, that's where we predominantly go to. So, Robert, when you go down there, are you staying for a month or two or three months? It's varied, anywhere from you know a couple of weeks to a couple of months. At the moment, we have a property. It doesn't have any buildings on it, so we want to build our own casita and then eventually a bigger casa on the property. But at the moment, we've been going down, staying either in hotels or doing a rental house while we've been there. Usually, if we fly down for a couple of weeks, we'll just stay at a hotel. If we drive down, then we're renting a house and we're staying for a longer period of time. So a lot of people go to Mexico to save money on their retirement. A number of expats tend to go down, especially to Baja, California, because it's so beautiful. Is it affordable? Mm -hmm. I know in recent years, especially when a town becomes really up and coming, the prices start going up in the hotels and things. When you go down there, is it still really affordable for the average person to go down there and spend some time? I think so. I mean, you know, it's just like going anywhere, really. If you want to spend money, you certainly can. Um, there are great galleries you can buy art in. There are really fantastic restaurants that are going to cost you more money. But also, you can go to some of the cheaper restaurants and have really fantastic food, great Mexican food, you know, for example, incredibly fresh, fantastic ingredients, and it's a lot cheaper. You, if you have a kitchen where you're staying, if you're renting a house or something, you can go and shop for your groceries, and the cost of the groceries is a lot lower than it is certainly where I live here in Canada. If we're living there, cooking our own food, doing that sort of thing, or going to reasonably priced or cheaper restaurants, then certainly it's definitely cheaper than being in Canada. Absolutely. What are the prices per day for hotels? And there's a wide right. there's a really there's a really wide range and it depends on if you're renting a house it depends on the the specific house you're looking at you know um for example in town decent house for a month um we've paid two thousand dollars uh you can get them cheaper you can pay twice that much you know and there are if you if you google Toto santos rental houses, you'll find several websites which have a lot of information, a lot of houses. They show you pictures, all the details about the properties. And um, there's one particular realty company which we deal with always because we love them, which is called Ricardo Amigo Real Estate. And they're right in Toda Santos. They're fantastic. Combination of Americans and Mexicans uh, who are there in that company. And we bought our land from them. We rented houses from them. And uh, I've been dealing with them for seven years now and had nothing but great experiences dealing with them. So, And on their website, they do have rental houses as well as properties for sale. We center on, on world travel. And uh, I have a friend, Andy Graham, the Pueblo Traveler, that uh, he can, he's been traveling the world for oh, over 15 years now. He's been to over 90 countries. But his, mm -hmm. his thing is he always looks for a room and he can all, mostly... In 90% of the planet, he can get a room for $10 a day. So in the, oh, wow. in the industrialized countries, we, we tend to spend a little bit more, a little bit more than yes. really <laughs> than we should be spending on our, on our rentals. So would you say, or on our daily uh, hotels, so would you say someone could come down and for 10 to $20 a day find a hotel room, or would it be much more than that? A hotel room? I have not seen at that price, No. It's more than that. Mind you, I, I'm sure that there are some places. I mean, there, there's, there's bound to be some, you know, uh, kind of more rustic beach shack kind of, you know, palapa roofed places that I'm sure you probably could get for, for a very, very good price. If you want to stay somewhere that is, you know, more fully equipped, 
maybe with a pool, maybe close to downtown where you can walk to restaurants and things like that. You know, of course, you're going to be paying more. But there is a wide variety. They're all little boutique hotels in Todos Santos, though. I think the biggest hotel in town has about 15 rooms. So they're all quite small. There's a couple that, that we really like, but one that, that um, I know we stayed at last time and we'll be staying at next time, which is called the Hotel Casa Tota, T-O-T-A. It's got a great location. It's a very kind of simple, modern, minimalist type of a place. It's perfect for what it is, you know. And uh, super friendly. They've got a great restaurant on site and a bar on site. They've got a little pool, and it's a very convenient location. So, yeah, we love it. I couldn't honestly tell you what the prices are for it because I, I don't remember. But I know that there's a variety of rooms. You know, you get a smaller room, you're going to be paying less. Some snowbirds tend to, to drive down and some fly down. Do you usually do you drive down or do you just fly down to Boston? We've done both. Yeah, we've done both. It, it depends on how much time we have for a particular trip. But, but yeah, driving is exciting. It, it's a fantastic drive. I mean, from Calgary, Canada to Cabo San Lucas is a phenomenal distance. You know, you're crossing north to south through the entire United States and then the entire Baja Peninsula. So it's, it's a, a very long drive. I think the fastest that we've done it going down was five days. And the first few days are, are very, very fast, actually. You're, you're doing maybe 14 hours and then 12 hours and then 10 hours for the first three days of driving. And then a little bit shorter days, maybe eight hours a day in the Baja in order to be able to do more sightseeing. You know, the United States you kind of have to whiz through if you're coming from here and doing it in five days. It's much, much nicer to do it in a longer time and take your time and be able to, you know, say, hey, that looks fun. Let's stop and look at that and not have to worry about kind of getting there by a certain date. So that's definitely the way to do it casually. Baja itself is an amazing drive. I mean, you know, you think of it as being a thousand miles of desert, which it is, but the desert changes. You know, you're going through these mountain passes and then you come around and there's a new desert expanse ahead of you and it's totally different than the previous one, you know. Some of them are filled with massive boulders and it's just uh, different foliage, different plant life, different cactus. So uh, and sometimes you're inland, you're in the mountains and other times you're on the Pacific coast or the coast of the Sea of Cortez, you know, Gulf of California. So it, it's a very, very diverse area and really beautiful we found nothing but always wonderfully friendly people the whole way through the baja and great experiences everywhere we we really love it it sounds like a lovely place and i would uh, encourage more people to go down and check out baja california tell us a little bit about your riding how you started one of our team members is a, a fellow called steve warneck who wrote for star trek deep space nine so steve and i particularly have been collaborating quite a lot for the Space Opera Society. We found that we work really well together. So we've been doing script writing together on several different projects, one of which is the Moonbase Alpha Legacy series. We have um, co-written the pilot for that series, the proposed series. So that's one thing that I've been doing in terms of television writing, script writing. I've done a lot of book writing, a lot of no specifically nonfiction book writing. How I got into it, was by a unique fluke and coincidence, you know, how they kind of converge and sometimes change the course of your life sometimes. But back in 1995, I believe, a friend of mine in Portland, Oregon, called Anthony Wynn, was organizing a charity production of a stage play called Love Letters. It was being done as a fundraiser for Parkinson's disease treatment and research. He had cast in the show, it's a two-person show, he'd cast two actors, June Lockhart, of course, who was uh, the mother in Lassie and the mother in Lost in Space, so a lot of your listeners will know who she is, and Barry Morse. So being friends with Tony, I was going to go, and I'm being a fan of Barry Morse, of course, being a fan of Space Center 9, I was going to go and I was going to help out. So I did that, had a great time. Tony and I spent a lot of time with Barry. He liked us, we liked him, we got along really well. The show was a huge success. So the following year, we did it again with Barry Morse's one-man show instead. And at that point, having done a couple of shows back-to-back -back with him, we realized, okay, there's definitely something here. We work, we work well together. Tony and I 
fell in love with the stories that Barry was telling about his life and his past and his experiences. And we said to ourselves, really, you know, he should have his autobiography. He should have his memoirs. And we thought, well, hey, you know, let's make a proposal to him. So we did. We came up with a proposal to write, to ghostwrite, essentially, his memoirs for him. We presented that to him. He loved it. He had faith in us, not having experience, but being passionate about what we wanted to do. He believed in that and gave us a chance. And that was the beginning of another dozen years of working with Barry before he passed, until he passed away. And we worked in that time on, I think, uh, at least 15 different stage productions in the U.S. and in Canada. We did uh, convention appearances with him. We did television. We did radio. We did all kinds of things. And we wrote, co-wrote with him numerous book projects, including his autobiography. And it was a phenomenal experience. Out of that came all kinds of other things as well, of course. And we're still working Anthony Wynn and I are still working with Barry Morse's estate to continue to strengthen and uh, sort of cement his legacy in the industry. At the moment, we're working on an amazing project, which Barry's son has been so generous to us, and he has lent us all of the letters that Barry and his wife exchanged with each other over a 60-year time span from 1939 to 1999, dating back to before they were married. So we have all of these letters, and at the moment, we're working on turning those into both a book and a stage play. You never know where things are going to lead you. <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you know, decades after you started a project, uh, we're still working on Barry Morse projects. So I would say to anybody who wants to write, just follow your passion, you know, follow your passion. If you love something, that's what you should be doing. Get involved with people that, that love the same thing you do. Absolutely. Volunteer, you know, get involved. I mean, you know, if, if uh, there's an actor that you like who happens to be doing a charity show somewhere, maybe you can get involved and, and help out. And you never know. You never know where things might lead. So Stephen Warnack and I have co-written this pilot episode for Moonbase Alpha Legacy, uh, which is intended to be a feature length for television. It would be two hours broadcast. Of course, the actual running time of the show would be more like you know an hour and a half minus commercials. And the script is finished. The script is done. We have had amazing, fantastic input from Christopher Penfold, who is the original script editor from Space 1999, season one. And Chris uh, wrote... Uh, numerous episodes of Space Center to the Nine, year one and year two. And so he's working as our script consultant for all of our SOS shows and, of course, for Moonbase Alpha Legacy. So Christopher's input on the this pilot script, that is really exciting. I've heard such good things about the pilot and, and that it was just a fantastic story. I can't say too much about it. I mean, the, the, basically, you know, the concept is that we pick up the story – a certain amount of years later, it is a sequel series to Space 1989. It's not a, you know, a reimagining or anything like that. It's a sequel series where there will be some of the original people and there will be a lot of new people. And we pick up the story a certain amount of years later and we um, get it going again. I can't say how because that would be giving it away, but we get it going again. <laughs> And, and to have Christopher Penfold involved has been wonderful. And one of my favorite moments, very quickly, was when Christopher said to us that Johnny Byrne would have loved it. And, of course, Johnny Byrne was the other, you know, god of year one Space 1999 script writing. So that was a, a really special thing to hear from Christopher Penfold. Robert, thank you so much for joining us on Travel of Tours. Tell people how they can join in and help you progress with the Space Opera Society. Of course, the website for the Space Opera Society is www.spaceoperasociety.com. You can go there and link to our Indiegogo campaign fundraiser where you can contribute anywhere from $1, literally just from $1 on up. And you can also, on our website, watch promotional videos where you can see interviews with some of the actors who are involved in our shows, people like Nick Tate, Armin Shimmerman, Kevin Sorbo. You can see special effects that we're working on right now 
for Moonbase Alpha Legacy, which are being done by Wes Sargent, who did the effects for all the Stargate series. So there's a, a huge amount of material for people to check out. Again, spaceoperasociety.com. So I'll put a link to your website on the, the show notes so people can go ahead and just click and go visit your website. Robert, thank you so much. I wish you continued success. Thank you. That was Robert E. Wood. Thank you, Robert, for coming and speaking with us today on Travel of Tours. Next Tuesday, we'll be speaking with Tammy Klein, one of Robert's colleagues who recently produced some of the videos that you see. She actually starred in the intro video when you go to spaceoperasociety.org. That's Tammy introducing you to what the Space Opera Society is all about. We'll be speaking with Tammy and uh, discussing where the Space Opera Society is going and how you can get involved. So please join us on the next Travel of Tours next Tuesday at 9 p.m. only on Blog Talk Radio.